Scared to death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that has no hollow heart, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be, until thou art remotely made, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Camper Lulu. Camper Lulu. And we are into October, and we have an extra show this October. You can grab tickets right now to October 13th event at badmagicmerch.com. True Tales of Hallow's Eve Horror, 6 p.m. Pacific Time. Again, October the 13th, Friday the 13th. Woohoo! And then you can uh, re-watch the show through November 1st, noon Pacific Time, at moment.co. So you can rewatch on Halloween if you would like. Or or any day before. Or any or all the days. Uh, you can get tickets at either uh, moment.co or badmagicmerch.com. And yes, Lindsay mentioned camp. Uh, hope to see mm-hmm. some of the campers that we were just with in Pennsylvania uh, at our at our live scared to death. Um, and big thank you to the staff at Camp No Counselors. The 2023 Wet Hot Bad Magic Summer Camp was so fun. Thanks to everyone who attended. It was magical. Like, we'll, we'll talk about it more on the bonus episode because I know some of you don't want to hear about it. <laughs> right, right, right. Like, if you weren't there, you don't want the FOMO. And then if yeah. you were there, it's like, maybe you're camped out at this point, although I doubt it based on what I'm seeing in the oh Facebook God. group. But it was like... Magical. It was magic. Uh, and then, yeah, met a few campers from Vermont uh, at the summer camp. And so hopefully we'll see them at the Vermont Comedy Club uh, October 5th, 6th, and 7th. I'll be there. So by the time you hear this, it'll be this weekend. Yeah, I'll be in Burlington. Burlington. What a special thing to be able to go there during like oh. prime fall season. I'm so excited to go. Yes. And last very quick thing, brand new design featuring an adorable wide-eyed bat and large words oh, yeah. of spoopy, excuse me, available now in a t-shirt and mug at badmagicmerch.com. Great. And then how many tales this week uh, do you have for us, horror podcast buddy? Hey, horror, co- horror podcast buddy. I, I will tell you what I have. But I just wanted to really quickly, yeah. I forgot to tell you this before the show, I have the numbers. And since we're into October, I just want to recap September charity. Oh, yeah. We were donating to Camp Mori, a, 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 a nonprofit that not only helps people who don't have the finances to get to camp, but also like guides them through college and so many amazing experiences. Okay, now on the Patreon side of it, we were going to donate $13,729 to Camp Mori with $1,525 going into the scholarship. Yeah. But we took all the tips from camp. The bartenders so generously said, we'll give all of our tips. So between the cash tips, yeah. which were, and the Venmo tips, the total was $3,496. Y'all tipped about $3,500. So now the donation this month is going to be a whopping $17,225. Way to go. <laughs> Everybody who was at camp, way to boost that up. It's amazing. It's incredible. We're so proud to be able to make that donation with your support. And with that, Dan, I have two stories. Okay. My first story, less scary and more bizarre questioning. Yeah. Uh, about a bunny. About a bunny. Is this going to be another scary chicken situation? Oh, my God. The scary chicken. Maybe. Are we going to have a scary chicken and a scary bunny? I, possibly. Okay. I'm, maybe. Maybe. And making it worse in story two, I have a haunted house tale that ha- featuring one of my least favorite things, frogs. <laughs> bunny and a frog. A bunny and a frog. We're just going like, w- you wouldn't know. Wouldn't have guessed that. I know, like fall animals. I'm really getting into it, you know? These are- <laughs> Is a frog a fall animal? I, no, I was just saying like fall and animals. Oh, okay, I'm just okay. really, yeah. I'm going into like the farm vibe. So <laughs> like, I guess there's a farm with a pond with frogs, and then there's like bunnies running around. All right. You know, you get it. Super, super Halloween themed. I, I have an unusual subject for my first story as well. I have my two, and I, I love this. Uh, the story revolves around a clock. Could a clock be an occult object? Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, could it have some sort of demonic entity attached to it? Uh, it's a very wild story. Uh, very intense. Is ne- it cool and interesting also? Mm-hmm, okay, it is. Good. And then next, uh, the story of a ton of UFO sightings coming from Italy in October of 1954. Could roughly 10,000 people all have seen the same UFOs at a football match? Oh, okay. Yep. So I won't give any any more away. 
Uh, y'all, y'all cozied up? I am all cozied up, Dan. I am wearing some socks that I got from camp. Mm-hmm. Look at these special Halloween slippies. Cool. And they're, yep, grippy, so I'm safe. I can go to grippy jail, grippy sock jail <laughs> with these ones. Woo. Okay, decent amount of setup for this uh, first bizarre story. Okay, let's do it. In, in such a good and creepy way. Uh, yeah, it's a horrible story, but that's what we like here. It's a gorgeous clock. Incredible craftsmanship. Truly a work of art. If only that art wasn't also completely evil. My father, before he passed, told me it was made by a man named Richard Baker. Mr. Baker was a renowned clockmaker who worked for the London Clockmakers Company, back when being a clockmaker was a much more known, prestigious, and respected profession than it is now. Back before clocks were mostly mass-produced, primarily in dreary factories in China or Indonesia or some other place with a woefully mistreated workforce constructed with the cheapest possible material. This clock was made by hand, built by a man who was more artist than he was a builder or mechanic. Timekeepers were his canvases. Mr. Baker was most active in the last few decades of the late 17th century in London. And while many of his clocks have been lost, many others, if not most, still remain. And it's not uncommon for them to be valued at 40,000 pounds or more. Holy crap. His timepieces were truly built to last, still holding the time as accurately as ever several centuries after being built. The one now sitting in a corner of my attic, completely covered in a thick mass of blankets held in place with steel cables and drenched in holy water blessed by a priest, has to be Baker's finest work. And is most unknown. I have no doubt that were I to sell it, I could get well over 500,000 pounds for it. It's a large, long-cased clock, commonly called a grandfather clock, standing over six and a half feet tall, made primarily of cherry with Japanese walnut decorative pieces, such as two hand-carved ravens above the clock case. It features a brass dial, silvered chapter ring, and gold-plated decorative accents on all four corners around the clock face. A bird and flower, marquetry, covers a decorative pendulum door. A mostly bird and flower marquetry. Small, barely noticeable symbols and numbers are hidden throughout the pattern. If no one ever told you to look, you'd probably never see them. But once you have seen them, it's as if they also see you. And you can't believe you missed them before. They're all you notice now. I'll never again use this clock. Not ever. But I'll also never sell it. I'm afraid of what might happen if I were to try. Once I'm gone, I'm not sure what will become of it. I'd ask to have it destroyed, but I'm afraid of it changing the mind of whoever were to try and do that. Or, even if they were successful, I'm terrified of what that might unleash. I hope that whatever evil is attached to it, whatever evil it was made with, will remain contained somehow if its visage stays hidden and it has no one to watch, corrupt, and torment. I'll never be sure exactly how it became what it most certainly is, but I believe that some sort of curse or demon was woven or conjured into its very design. While I haven't been able to find definitive documentation regarding my suspicions, it seems likely that Mr. Baker was very knowledgeable in occult practices. Witch hunting was at its peak in England while he was making his timekeepers, and it, and it would only make sense that he would keep secret any experimentation or practice in the occult if, in fact, he dabbled, or did much more than dabble. I did find a record in a ledger of Mr. Baker taking several business trips to Edinburgh and selling at least one of his clocks to Major Thomas Weir, a man known for being strangled and then burned at the stake in 1670 for crimes of incest, bestiality, and sorcery, crimes he confessed to while under no pressure to do so, or no duress. The symbols and numbers found in the clock's design are my best evidence for Mr. Baker's dalliance in the occult, the upside-down cross of St. Peter, the eye of Horus, the number nine is common, a number long associated with pain and sorrow. And while I don't know the full history of the clock's owners, the few stories I was able to uncover are full of premature deaths, lots of accidents, and at least one tale of a madness that took a previously of sound mind physician and antiquities collector and left him twitching and rambling wild-eyed in an asylum for the rest of his days. What does it all mean? I do not know. But I do know what happened to me, what the clock made me do, and it did make me do it. You must believe me. This is not who I ever was. It is not who I am today. The clock cursed me. Here's my sad story. Time now for the tale of the devil's clock. My father bought the clock shortly before he died. He'd already been in poor health for many months when it was moved into his home, and he was quite advanced in age, in his late 80s. 
So when his decline intensified almost immediately after purchasing the clock, no one made a connection. But I did notice during many of our visits how intense and unusual his interest in the clock was. He had long loved to sit and read late into the evening in his drawing room. But after purchasing the clock and having it placed in that drawing room, I caught him several times sitting in his favorite chair, warm tea on the table beside him, just staring at it with a peculiar smile upon his face, admiring it as if it were a painting, or rather watching it with amusement, as if it were a show and not a static and unchanging thing. No book, no telly, just watching the time pass, quite literally. And later, during the last week or so of his life, he lost all interest in being anywhere but his drawing room. He was never like that before. He seemed perpetually agitated and continually looked exhausted as well, as if he were not sleeping properly. Quite ill now, his hospice nurse told me that he'd been having night terrors, but she wouldn't speak of what they were about. She heard him having what sounded like particularly bad nightmares on the night he died. Also, that last night, completely unlike him, he left his bed hours before sunrise and walked into, of course, that drawing room, quietly. His nurse barely heard him. No tea, no water even, no late night snack was found at his side the next morning. His nurse found his body a few hours after checking on him and being told he would like to sit in private. She'd only found him 20 or so minutes before I arrived to talk to him prior to going about my day. She was visibly shaken. She told me that she had already called the funeral home and his doctor and that I might not want to see him. When I asked why, she just muttered something about his face, how he died with his eyes wide open in a manner she'd never seen before. I should have listened. Instead, I immediately walked into the drawing room and saw something I now wish I could erase from my memory forever. But would it have changed anything that occurred going forward? No. No, I suppose it wouldn't have. My father died staring at that clock, and he died with an expression of pure terror on his face. Eyes opened wide as if fixed upon a murderer standing in front of him with a gun pointed at his head, or an axe reared back and ready to chop. His hands dug into the arms of his chair like claws. A true death grip, if you will. Like he was seated not in his comfortable home, but speeding along a rickety roller coaster, hoping to keep himself from flying off. In his mouth. His lips were pulled back to reveal the full scope of how abnormal his death was by means of an expression I don't know how to properly convey. Pained? Anguished? Perhaps just frightened is best. He died looking the most frightened I've ever seen anyone look. Officially, he died from his body finally losing its fight with cancer. And I am well aware that the cancer would have killed him soon enough. But cancer is not what did him in. Now I know better. Now I know that that clock killed him. I know how that sounds. But I also know what I've, what I've seen and what I've experienced. I was unsettled by the way he died. I still am. But at that time, I didn't think there was anything actually wrong with the clock. Now I know better. Now that it's too late to undo what the clock did to me, or rather, what it did through me. And it was the clock. No Bobbies nor judge would ever believe me, but it was the clock. I moved into my father's place just a few weeks after he died. He left it to me in his will, and while I already was perfectly happy in my own home, I lived alone, and my terrace house was perfectly move-in ready and easier to sell than my father's large Victorian. His house was also closer to my office. I found myself sitting in my father's favorite chair that very first night, staring at the clock. I definitely was thinking about my father's final night and how odd it was that he had chosen to come down and gaze upon it right before he passed. But also I found the presence of the clock strangely comforting. It gave me such a sense of calm and peace, or perhaps meditative is the best word for the effect the clock had on me. Immediately upon sitting and gazing upon it, my heart rate would lower, my blood pressure would drop, and it's not as if I felt terribly stressed without it. I wasn't riddled with anxiety or anything of the sort. But however good I might feel away from the clock, I just felt a bit better when I was near it. I continued to spend time in front of the clock in the evenings, night after night, for weeks before I felt any ill effects. The more time I spent before it, the more I enjoyed its silent company. Silent but not uneventful. My mind would consistently become lost in the most wonderful daydreams in its presence. I've always daydreamed a bit, but not like this. I've never been the true wandering mind type. But now I was constantly off on another adventure to ancient Egypt or Babylonia, ancient Rome, or right here in London, but in centuries past, always in the past, 
I was a priest watching the building of some ancient pyramid or a nobleman at a gladiator match at the Colosseum in Rome, leaving to attend some lavish, decadent sexual party afterwards. All these little movies were playing in my mind's eye, always while sitting in the drawing room in front of the old clock. It was as if it emitted some sort of intoxicating imagination accelerant. And pretty early on, looking back, I forgot all about the clock's connection with my father. I didn't think of that at all. I also didn't find myself reflecting on my new and strange habit while I was at work and away from the devilish object. It was just my new, very comfortable routine. When the nightmares began, I didn't connect them with my father's experiences either. These dreams always began different, but always ended pretty much the same. I might be inside some temple in ancient Egypt, or Babylonia, or Rome, or perhaps the dark woods of England at night. I was always a priest of some sort, and always worshipping some strange and not totally defined or understood god. I might be the only priest, or one of several members of some priesthood or coven. I might be a man, or a woman, young or old. But what I always needed to do was to perform a sacrifice. My god demanded blood. On a few occasions, I was the sacrifice, and I felt everything. I felt the ceremonial dagger slicing across my throat, the blood pouring down upon my shoulders and chest, the gurgling for air as I began to both drown in my own blood and also not to be able to suck in fresh breath. Before all of that was rendered meaningless by the lack of blood flow to my brain, leading to my vision quickly fading, slumping to the floor, and the life quickly leaving my body as I listened to the rhythmic chanting of the priests around me, the dark soundtrack to my final moments. Or I'd feel the blade sink into my stomach as I lay upon some sort of altar, the priest's voice rising and growing in intensity as he pulls my entrails out from inside my body while my heart still beats, before he finally thrusts his fists inside of me and reaches for my heart to tear out. While I'm still conscious and shock protects me from most of the pain, I see a dark shape appear in the room, inside some sort of ring marked off on the floor, an evil beast from hell or whatever hell really is. And I am certain that this thing, this great and terrifying beast, this is what I've been sacrificed to appease. When either I die or when I help sacrifice someone else to conjure up this abomination and the terror of its presence makes it feel like I'm going to die from the pure terror of it all, that's when I wake up screaming. For the first few weeks of this going on, I didn't connect these new terrible nightmares with the clock in any way whatsoever. In fact, oftentimes before trying to fall back asleep, I'd go grab a bite from the kitchen make myself a cup of tea, and then walk to the drawing room where I'd sit in trance and stare once again at Mr. Baker's beautiful timekeeper. Beautiful and rotten to its core. And then finally, after it had been twisting my mind for weeks, during one of my evening sitting and dreaming sessions, it spoke to me. Give me the blood I crave. Take the power that it brings. The first time it happened, I was about to take a sip and nearly dropped a hot cup of tea into my lap. My head spun around in a panic, thinking that someone else was in the house with me. And then I heard a low, powerful, deep hum emitting from the clock. It was hypnotic, magnetic, and it demanded my gaze. Images from some of my recent nightmares were transmitted into my brain, including more of what would happen after the beast had been summoned. The beast would devour the sacrifice, bones and all, as it transformed from a body of smoke and dreams into a true physical presence and then it would approach one of the priests, whoever had spilt the blood, and breathe some sort of black mist upon them. I could feel what they felt, the power and the ecstasy of the unnatural enchantment. More images flashed from the priest's future. Wealth, power, influence, pleasures of the flesh, extended life, all gifts from the beast. And in return, all the beast would demand was more blood. I was then released from that powerful hold the clock had over me and was once again just a man sitting in his dead father's drawing room. That first time, I convinced myself that I'd fallen back asleep in my father's chair and dreamt it all. But then a few nights later, it happened again. This time before I went to bed, while again sitting in front of the old clock's powerful gaze, I heard, Give me the blood I crave. Take the power that it brings. More images thrust into my head once more. But this time, they're not from the past. They're from what I initially thought was the present, but quickly learned was the future. I could see a woman who lived somewhere in my neighborhood, walking her little dog down the sidewalk in front of my father's house. I knew, not from any real-life interaction or gossip, but rather from the presence inside my own head, the presence connected to the old clock, that she lived alone and had no family in the area. Middle-aged, of average build, friendly and trusting, someone who was well-liked in the neighborhood but had no close friends living anywhere near. 
the perfect victim. I knew all of that with the same certainty I know my own name. And then in this terrible vision, as she walked past the tall, thick hedges that separated my father's home, or my home now, rather, from the sidewalk, I opened my heavy front gate and said hello. I tell her that I've been seeing her walk her dog at night for weeks, and that my own dog passed away shortly before I moved in, and I have a bag of treats and toys. Would she be kind enough to give them to her pooch and put them to good use? I'm lying. Why am I doing this? She agrees. I invite her to bring her dog into the yard while I quickly run into the house to grab it all. And being a trusting soul, she enters and shuts the gate behind her. I then walk into the house and grab a small box and a bag of dog food. My father actually did have a dog that died about six months earlier, and I still hadn't thrown out everything. And I also grab a hammer and stick the hammer's handle into my back pocket. I hand her the box and bag, offer to grab the gate from her, and while her back is turned to me for a moment, I take out the hammer and quickly smash it into her skull. She drops to the ground instantly, not dead, but close. And then before the poor dog of hers makes a lot of attention, drawing noise, I quickly strike it as well, several times in rapid succession. I kick its dead body aside in the yard and drag my poor neighbor into the house, first up the stairs, then into the drawing room. I lay out her soon-to-be corpse in front of the clock. No! I scream out and break free from the trance I'd been in. No, 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 I said, shaking my head. I won't do that for you, but I will find that hammer and I will tear you apart with it. I ran down the stairs to grab it, found it, ran back up the stairs, but then when I walked into the drawing room, I felt that strange peace again. The peace I felt around the clock those first few weeks, and suddenly I felt so foolish. What was I doing? It was just a clock. Just decorative wood on the outside and metal gears on the inside, not a living thing, not a cursed object of some kind. I laughed out loud and set the hammer down. I wondered why I'd been having so many dreams of late, horrid dreams, and I decided it must have something to do with grieving my father's death. I still did not connect my nightmares to the ones my father had been having. I think the force inside the clock was strong enough to prevent me from doing that, and I left the room and went to bed. The very next night, it happened again. Sitting alone in the drawing room, listening to the hypnotic tick-tock, tick-tock, I hear it. Give me the blood I crave. Take the power that it brings. And the dreadful images return. Or at least I thought they were just images. I swear to you, I thought it was all only in my head. I approached the neighborhood woman outside my gate as she walked by with her dog. I offered her the food and toys. She followed me into the yard. I ran into the house. I brought the hammer down once upon her, several times on the dog. Tossing the dead pet aside, I dragged her unconscious and badly wounded body into the house, up the stairs, into the drawing room. And again, as I lay her in front of the clock, I scream out, No! I won't do it! I won't do that for you! But this time, when I snap out of it, I'm no longer still sitting in the chair. I'm standing at the entrance to the room, her unconscious body at my feet, a hammer still in my hand, a very bloody hammer held in a very bloody hand. There is blood all over my arm, my trousers, my shoes. Oh God, oh God, this can't be real. This isn't happening. Give me the blood I crave. Take the power that it brings. Shut up, I scream, shut up! Just let me wake up, this isn't happening. Give me the blood I crave. Take the power that it brings. More images projected into my head. The ones from the nightmares I've been having for weeks. Scenes of sacrifices going back centuries. And then a scene of the present. I'm watching myself open the pendulum door. I'm feeling for a hidden compartment inside. Finding it. Opening it. And pulling a small ceremonial dagger out from within. The dagger from my nightmares. It vibrates with intense power. Ancient, dark, mysterious power. No! Please! I snap back inside my own head, seeing out from my eyes again. Don't make me do this, please! I don't want this! Give me the blood I crave. Take the power that it brings. I hear chanting, rhythmic, repetitive chanting. Suddenly I'm not alone, surrounded by hooded figures making the terrible sound. The woman wakes up, moaning in pain. And instead of helping her, I only bring her up to her knees and barely speak the words, The beast must be fed. As I feel the dagger, the ancient knife that's in my hand, glide across her throat, immediately followed by the sensation of warm blood spilling out. What have I done, I think? What have I done? I release my grip on her and let her body fall to the ground, the blood pooling all around, the blood pooling around the clock, spilling beneath it. And that's when I see the beast for the first time. The thing from my dreams. It appears before me, and it devours her. All of her. It stands and brings its dreadful face to mind, its bloody, savage smile stretched into a horrid grin, and then fades away before my eyes, leaving me with the murder I just committed. 
I fall to the ground and wake up the following morning, covered in blood. The floor is covered in blood as well, but there is no body. I run downstairs and out into the yard. I do find the bag of dog food, the box of toys, and a leash connected to the dead dog in the yard that had its skull brutally bashed in. But I find no woman. I collect the remains of the dog and everything else I can find and bring it all inside. I call in sick to work, clean the mess up as best I can, and make my plan to stop the clock from making me want to kill again. I drove across town and bought moving blankets and steel cables. I went to a Catholic church I'd never set foot in before, and the priest there, no doubt taking pity upon me based on how distraught I looked, allowed me to fill a large container with holy water and take it home. Drenching the blankets in the water, I decided there was no time like the present, and while still light out, I ran into the drawing room, holding up a blanket like a shield between me and the clock, and I tossed it over the cursed object, and I swear I heard it scream as I did so. Give me the blood I crave. Take the power that it brings. I scream myself as I did my best to fight against the terrible images pouring into my mind. Images of being punished, being torn apart by the demon I saw the night before. Images of the last members of my family dying horrific deaths. And as I continued to do the beast's bidding, I was able to fight them off and to add the rest of the blankets and seal them to the clock's body with the steel cables. Next was to move it. Big and heavy, I was able to tie a rope to it and pull it up into the attic. It hummed with dark energy the entire time. Over and over I heard, Give me the blood I crave. Take the power that it brings. Once in the attic, I moved it into the corner, left it facing the wall. Then after shutting the attic entrance, I cut the drawstring that pulled the ladder down, making it so much harder to ever re-enter. It's been a long time now since I put it up there. I won't say how long it's been, just like I won't leave my name for a few reasons. Selfishly, I don't want to spend the rest of my life in prison for murder. I also don't want to risk someone else finding a clock before I can maybe figure out how to properly destroy it. Sometimes I still hear it. Faintly, but I still hear the call. I hear the ticking first, louder than should be possible. I have dreams of what I've done, of what others have done for it before me. And I hear much more faintly than before, Give me the blood I crave. Take the power that it brings. Its call is so much weaker now. I hope for my sake and for the sake of who it might ask me to kill next, it remains that way. And I hope Mr. Baker burns in hell for what he created. Yeek! You know, your grandparents have a lot of clocks. Oh, yeah. True. Like, immediately I was just like, oh, shit. <laughs> I don't think I want to stay at grandma's house. I know. It was a huge grandfather clock, like, behind the front door. Mm-hmm. Mm-mm. About that height, yeah, about yeah. the same size. Not yeah. as old, but yeah. Well, old enough. <sighs> Ugh. Yeah, a little, little different when I told you it was intense. Yeah. I, I, do you have pictures? Mm-hmm, I do. Uh, this first one is an example of a Richard Baker grandfather clock from the late 17th century, sometime in the 1690s. Being a Cleveland Browns fan, I had to get out a Baker Baker touchdown maker. Oh, was, funny. In my head, I was like, Lindsay, that is not this story. I, I had, uh, for a little second, a little bit of time stuck, stuck uh-huh, in my head. I'm me like, too. Not lost to me that there was a dick baker in this story. Oh, oh, oh. Well, I also was thinking of um, the butcher baker. Oh, yes. Robert Hansen. Mm-hmm. Uh, this so, n- so maybe that name is cursed. Baker. Yeah, maybe. Dun, dun, dun. Next picture, a spooky looking long clock, eight feet tall. No date of origin is listed. I have no interest in a humongous clock. That one's kind of gothic looking. Yeah, they're cool, but I don't ever need one. Yeah. Uh, this next one is supposedly haunted clock that resides on the campus of Coe College in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. On October 19th, 1918, Coe announced that 18-year-old student Helen, Helen Roberts died of Spanish influenza, induced pneumonia. In an effort to preserve her memory, her parents donated this handsome grandfather clock to Voorhees Dormitory, which is allegedly where she died. Uh, sights of a shadowy figure, the feeling of a cold breeze near the clock, and uh, of hearing a disembodied voice have been reported ever since Helen's death. Huh. And then uh, this next one, continue with my recent fascination of how you can find stock photos for nearly any situation. I searched for man afraid of clock, <laughs> and I found so many photo shoots to choose from. So there was that. Okay. This next one, Dumb. even a little weirder. Yeah, a little corny. Uh-huh. And then he's so afraid of the clock on his bedside table. He's not looking in the right direction. No, there's other ones where he's like holding the clock, looking at the clock. But yeah, I thought this was the silliest. But I, again, I just love that there are photo shoots for every possible situation. I know. What is this? Color box? Is that yeah, the, one the, the website? One of the, one of the many websites where you can buy royalty free, you know, like obviously yeah. you just you pay for them, don't get the watermark. Yeah. Funny, 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 funny. I was having a hard <sighs> time figuring out when he was 
I, I was like, did he really bludgeon the neighbor? And then it was the dream, mm-hmm. and then he did. So then the second time that he was in that like loop, if yeah. you will, I was like, oh, nothing's going to happen. Whoopsies. Had a premonition of a horrible thing that did come true. Yeah, it's really, ugh. Uh, I got my own question answered because I asked if the author or the, the, you know, the storyteller, if he was in prison, but I guess not. Yeah, if this is all true, he- uh, Of course it's true. Wanted to get it off his chest and then um, doesn't want to get caught. I know. It, it is such like a, what a conundrum. Because mm-hmm. also then like, I, I know that in the story it says like she doesn't have any like family, friends, like close by, but it's like somebody oh, has sure. to be aware of her existence. Yes. So now she's just a woman who just went missing. One of the many millions of people I know. currently missing in the world. I know. Missing people really freak me out. Mm-hmm. Like, like just like, where did they go? So many. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Huh. Um, also, okay, not related to the story, but I was over here yeah. cracking up for those of you that were at summer camp. You recall that Dan was having a hard time turning the pages at summer camp because the printer paper was just a little bit thicker oh at my camp. Gosh. So I was like watching you turn the page and I just was holding in an er- internal giggle yeah. of like, oh my God, watching you struggle on stage at the Live Scared to Death was so amazing. <laughs> I could, I I could see a little bit of like panic in here. I was like, fuck, yep. fuck, 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 fuck. it only messed up the pacing I, like one time, a little, but it's like, it, uh, that was a funny thing I didn't think of. I'm like, we're just so used to always using our paper. Yeah. Um, I was like, oh, yeah. Uh, you know, like if it's a little bit glossy, that's a very different experience. It's yeah. so funny how like the, the, the most minor detail can put <laughs> yeah. something off. Totally, yeah, totally, totally. I know. I was like, it didn't bother me at all at camp. So watching you struggle was extra hilarious to me. <laughs> that's what I was saying. I was back uh, telling you before the show here, I was back there trying to push the buttons, but oh, yeah. what slightly threw me off is that we weren't showing pictures. Right. right you're like, so the in-between breaks between the stories was like a lot, lot shorter. And so yep. I had to be ready. <laughs> ready to come yeah. like, ah, yeah. I have to pay attention. Or hundreds of episodes of just being habitualized to this. Yeah. 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 Whew. Okay. Well, that, I, I liked that. That was a totally different story, but really cool. Okay, good. I don't think we've had a haunted possessed object in I don't know not in a while not, not like in a that. while not like that I mean generally it's like I feel like of recent stories it's usually like a Ed in the Rain Warren kind of yeah you know like somebody who specializes like a doll or and, a painting or mm-hmm, something yeah and dealing with those things a mirror yeah but a mm-hmm. clock mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm well done, well done. So you're ready to move away from a strange, undocumented claim of a killer clock and over to a strange but heavily documented UFO sighting. Oh. No setup for this one. Nice and short and to the point. Is it short and sweet? I wouldn't say it's sweet. Okay, fair. Time now for the tale of lights in Italy's sky. On the afternoon of October 27th, 1954, approximately 10,000 fans gathered at the Stadio Artemi Franchi in Florence, Italy, to watch a reserve football match between the Fiorentina Club and Pistoiza. Uh, Fiorentina were winning 6-2 to two when the game was interrupted just after halftime by what many still believe was a mass UFO sighting. After spectators initially shouting in mass and pointing at the sky, uh, the stadium quickly fell into a complete silence as thousands of people stopped and stared, stunned towards at least two large oblong objects described as egg-like or shaped like a cigar seen moving over the stadium before stopping above the crowd. Soon, many more than two objects were witnessed. Sources differ on exactly how many objects flew in the air and how exactly they moved, with numbers ranging up to 20 or more. One source described the objects as performing acrobatics. This incredible phenomenon was even documented in the referee's match report. (laughs) which stated that the game was suspended because spectators saw something strange in the sky. This phenomenal sighting lasted for around 15 minutes. Decades later, several witnesses spoke with the BBC about what they witnessed. Football player Ordico Magnini said, I remember everything from A to Z. It was something that looked like an egg that was moving slowly, slowly, slowly. Everyone was looking up and also there was some glitter coming down from the sky, silver glitter. We were astonished. We had never seen anything like it before. We were absolutely shocked. Spectator Gigi Boni described seeing multiple objects. They were moving very fast and then they just stopped. I would like to describe them as being like Cuban cigars. They just reminded me of Cuban cigars and the way they looked. Boni added, I think they were extraterrestrial. That's what I believe and there's no other explanation I can give myself. The Florentine quoted Romolo Tucci, captain of the rival team, as saying, It was a beautiful day. At a certain point, we realized that the fans were gazing up into the sky. It was spontaneous for us players to stop too. 
I saw something like small rings in the distance. What they actually were, I really don't know. As described by the witnesses, a silvery glitter fell down over the crowd as the objects hovered in the air. The local paper, La Nazione, published a photo of the UFO, which, was, which has strangely been lost. A man named Silvio Neri drew a sketch of the UFOs, which was published by the BBC. La Nazione described the incident in an article titled, Glass Fibers Fall on Tuscan Cities After Globes and Flying Saucers Pass By. The spectators at the stadium were not the only ones to witness the strange spheres in the air or the glittery substance that fell from the sky. Thousands of residents of Florence and its suburbs witnessed UFO sightings on October 27th and the days that followed. Many of these additional people made public reports. The silvery substance also coated a large portion of the city on the 27th. No one had any idea what the flying objects actually were, but it seems that the majority of people's minds went straight to aliens. Roberto Panati, president of Italy's National UFO Center, said, At the time, the newspaper spoke of aliens from Mars. Of course, now we know that is not so. But we may conclude that it was an intelligent phenomenon, a technological phenomenon, and a phenomenon that cannot be linked with anything we know on Earth. Panati told the BBC that the sticky substance that fell from the sky is called angel hair. Some witnesses described it as similar to cotton wool or cobwebs. Remnants of the substance only lasted for about a day. It disintegrated rapidly upon contact, which made it difficult to save for future documentation. Panati claimed he was 10 years old when he saw the angel hair. He said, I remember, in broad daylight, seeing the roofs of the houses of Florence covered in this white substance for one hour, and just like snow, it evaporated. Giorgio Battini, a journalist for the... Uh, again, the paper, La Nazione, spoke about the sighting with the Italian TV program Voyager in 2003. On the day of the sighting, he received hundreds of phone calls from witnesses. He climbed on top of the newspaper building to see it for himself. He claimed he saw shiny balls moving towards the dome of a local cathedral. He went into the woods outside the city and found it covered by white fluff. He managed to gather samples of the angel hair on a matchstick and took them to the Institute of Chemical Analysis at the University of Florence. Professor Giovanni Canary and his lab team performed a spectrographic analysis and found that the substance contained boron, silicone, calcium, and magnesium, and that it was not radioactive. The sample also was allegedly photographed, but again, it's how weird, that photograph no longer seems to exist. And the material was destroyed during testing, and they did not make a conclusive identification. Scientific experts have spent decades following this extremely unusual event, trying to solve two mysteries— what were the flying objects hovering above the stadium and city, and what was that silvery substance made of? Although not paranormal in nature, the most popular explanation is perhaps more disturbing to many than aliens. U.S. Air Force pilot and astronomer James Mag Magaha told the BBC that the angel hair was actually silk from hordes of migrating spiders. Ew! He explained that at first he thought the UFOs seen at Florence that day were nothing more than a meteor breaking up upon entering the atmosphere. Meteors can be cigar-shaped, as the witnesses described, but he later came to believe that the UFOs were spiders. Magaha said, these spiders use webs as sails and they link together and you get a big glob of this stuff in the sky and the spiders ride on this to move between locations. They just fly on the wind and those things have been recorded at 14,000 feet above the ground. So when the sunlight glistens off this, you get all kinds of visual effects. And some of the stuff breaks off and falls to the ground. It all seems magical, of course, but I'm fairly confident that's what happened that day. According to the BBC, dozens of different species of spiders in the Northern Hemisphere migrate in September and October, which does match up with the time of the sighting, but many witnesses dispute the spider theory. Roberto Panati noted that spider silk is protein that contains nitrogen, calcium, hydrogen, and oxygen, which were not found in the samples of angel hair brought to the university. The Italian Committee for the Investigation of Claims on the Paranormal, a skeptic organization actually, has a different theory. They learned that the Italian Air Force was conducting exercises that day using um, chaff, a radar countermeasure that involves dropping flares from an aircraft. According to the Florentine, the chaff was used to confound radar systems and could have caused luminous reflections, but then that theory doesn't explain the angel hair. Others have speculated that the strange substance was caused by above-ground atomic bomb testing, molten glass fibers, a meteorite, or residue from textile manufacturing. But none of that fully explains the totality of what thousands and thousands of witnesses, uh, witnesses both observed and felt that day. Nearly 70 years later, the Stadio Artemi Franchi sighting remains unexplained. 
It's considered one of the most significant UFO sightings in world history because of the massive number of people who allegedly saw it and the documentation of the large amounts of so-called angel hair that fell down from the sky onto the crowd. To this day, no one knows if the city of Florence was truly visited by extraterrestrials or not. Dang. Uh, so many weird options. I know. I've never heard of that spider thing before. I know. I'm like, okay, if that's the thing, mm -hmm. how come that hasn't, like, that's not a thing that we all are aware of? It just feels like if it was like spiders, it's like, well, what? That only happened once? It was just a one? No, it's happened quite a bit when I looked into it. Yeah. I got some pictures. I don't know if I want to see this. But I will say I couldn't find a single picture of these, um, you know, spider webs moving like sailing spiders through the air, basically, that looked anything like you would consider to be a, a UFO sighting. But I was just thinking if there were so many of them. But then I wondered, like, wouldn't there be a shit ton of spiders felt by people that day? Uh, you would think. Uh, this first picture. I don't even know if I want to see this. This just this isn't a spider. This is just a picture of the uh, Stadio Artemi Franchi. So you can see, like, it's a big open stadium in Florence. Yeah. I mean, just that place filled up. That's a lot of people to see stuff. And then thousands more saw stuff around the city that day. Right, right. Now, this next picture is the spider set. This is the remnant of a mass spider. It's called ballooning near Wagga Wagga, Australia. Whoa. Real, real name. Wagga Wagga. What a fun name. In 2015. Uh, ballooning is also sometimes called kiting. It looks like, okay, for those of you who are not looking at the photographs right now, not watching on YouTube. Or checking uh, Instagram, yeah. I was getting there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it looks like snow. It looks like a mm -hmm. dusting of snow all over the ground with like small little peaks and valleys as well. Yeah. What the? It, it does kind of look like you just took a bunch of cotton candy and then just kind of like easily draped it over the top. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But knowing that that's like spider silk is so nasty. Yes. Uh, ballooning, sometimes called kiting is a process by which spiders and some other small invertebrates move through the air by releasing one or more gossamer threads to catch the wind, causing them to become airborne at the mercy of air currents and electric fields. Okay, but if that is true, then what I'm thinking of is like just this little like spidey guy, and then he kind of like, that's a balloon thingy out. <laughs> and then why isn't, he should be like parasailing. That's kind of what they're doing. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're like, like parasailing where, through why, the air. But then how come no one sees like globs of black spider all over? I don't, yeah, exactly. Um, this next one, uh, a picture of the remnants of spiders ballooning through some trees and power lines. Couldn't find a, a really like interesting pic of them doing this through the sky. Like the, the ones I saw pictures of them in the sky, it's like, you just see like a few tiny little specks of maybe a piece of web. Yeah. But like, like but more like a, uh, not like Charlotte's web though, like a little fishing line kind uh -huh, of thing. Uh -huh. So it just doesn't look like much uh, of anything. Yeah. That last photo, it almost looks like, um, like power lines. Yeah, there, there was power lines in that photo, yes. Oh, I was like, wow, and, those are some really so thick, like, no, no, it's so like it's, dripping from the power yeah, line. Yep, yeah, totally. Okay. And then this last picture, uh, this is just a, uh, it's the cover art for the September 1st, 1957 edition of La Dominica de Correa. I bet La Domenica, Domenica del, del Cor Correre. Correre. Correa. Uh, yes, it's it's Dominica in Korea. Yes, definitely. <laughs> it's uh, a wave of flying saucers over Italy is what's written there. And that uh, that magazine was an Italian weekly newspaper published in Milan. I mean, obviously not a real photo. No, but just a, a, their uh, interpretation of what people claim to see that day. Yeah, the, the description of it looking like a Cuban cigar was the one thing that I was like, that doesn't fit all the rest of the things. When I think of a UFO... I don't think of like a long, I don't think of a cigar shape. There has actually been. There's like, there's. Um, I know, I'm just saying that's not what I oh, think. Oh, what you think, yeah. I didn't yeah. say that there wasn't. I'm just saying that's yeah. what my mind goes to that like oval saucer shape. Yeah, there's the classic like 1940s is when the late 19, I think 1947 is when the first saucer claims. I'm just pulling that up my butt, but I think so. Um, like that's like the what we think of of yeah. like the classic UFO, the the disc, the metal, the metallic disc, right? Sometimes with a little bubble mm -hmm. on the top. Um, but then the flying saucer, yeah. But then not that much later, yeah. These cigar shaped objects kept being spotted in the sky, hmm. and and there's definitely been a lot of sci fi films that have played with that. Like uh, that is my least enjoyable genre, sci fi. Oh, I know, I like it so much, but yeah. I, well, I, I just feel like you haven't done a great job of like having me watch. Okay, the last thing you were like, oh, this is like sci-fi. We watched Silo. That is no, not sci-fi. But I hadn't seen it before. At all. Yeah, yeah, no, no. You got to get me in. You got to get me in. I just don't know what the thing is. Because I'll, I'll watch anything. Man, now I'm trying to think of one. Uh, Event Horizon, I think is what it is. 
Logan, have you seen that? It's like Lawrence Fishburne. Yeah, long oh, time ago, can. but yes. It's it's a horror sci-fi, and ooh, I I loved it. Okay, that's. I mean, good. It's, it's a little dated, so it's like the the effects aren't going to be as good as modern CGI. That does, none of that bothers me. Yeah, it's recent enough for it, but it's like it's just creepy. It's yeah. set in space. Who's he married to? I feel like Lawrence Fishburne is married to someone that's like you're like no oh, idea. They're married. Oh man, this like beautiful tall woman. Oh, it's gonna drive me. Gina Torres nailed it. I don't know who she is. You would if you saw. You would if you saw, because she was on Suits, and it's just like super, super oh. random. Because okay. you're like, wait, what? And then you're like, oh my god, yeah. But I don't think they're like a couple that you don't see photographed together frequently. So it's huh. like a More private, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, Glitter in the Sky. I was singing Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. I was like, did Elton John write a song about about, that alien about UFOs? Um, I did think it was weird that like that stuff then just like disappears. It just like melts away or whatever. The angel hair, as they call it. Yeah, I like Logan's cotton candy reference like that where it just dissipates. And that makes sense too because then it's like if you think of the cotton candy analogy, as soon as something wet touches it, it yeah. disappears. And I guess the same thing for like, yeah, like a spider web. Like if you put a spider web mm -hmm. in like a, I don't know, a bag to save it forever, I, I would imagine, especially if it was like open to the air yeah. to, ox uh, to be able to oxidize, I think. But like I would think it would just kind of go away. Yeah. I wouldn't think it would last. Well, but I don't know if that's true about spider webs because when you think about like, okay, the corner of like a fence where we see spider webs and then it rains, the spider web doesn't go away. Hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, wonder, I, I wonder if there's I different think, kinds. Yeah. Probably like different spiders in different yeah. kinds of like silks that they yeah. produce or whatever, like different kinds of proteins. And then, I mean, I, they're durable, but they're not that durable. So I wonder yeah. if like some, I don't know. I have a lot of spider questions now, apparently. <laughs> uh, okay. And, the, and then the last thing that was like, you know, peculiar about that story was the the photographs that disappeared or went missing. I know, those two different, like, yeah, I was like, that's odd. Yeah, that's a... Because it's not disputed that there was these claims. Like, right. there are old, you know, Italian newspapers you can find online that, like, have stories about this. It's, it's pretty sure. pretty well documented, but I was like, oh, that is weird that this, like, the best photo taken just is gone. Just gone. Gone forever. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Hidden in the bottom of the Vatican. Now, before I go yeah. into my part, do you want to do your classic? Like, do you want to show off your Italian? Because I like, oh, yeah, I, know. I, I, I was holding if, back. So I don't know if you friends here on Scared to Death who are not time suckers, if you know that Dan is fluent in Italian and maybe he wants to share a little bit. Maserati Bugatti Spaghetti, Maserati Bugatti Spaghetti, Maserati Bugatti Spaghetti, Luigi Pizza Pie. Isn't that beautiful? We have our, <laughs> our friend Doug, who is the MC of summer camp this uh, both years, actually, uh, and will be for as long as he'll let us have him. Uh, he like told us this funny thing like, oh, yeah, yeah. Like the way you speak Italian is like uh, an Italian dish, the name of a car and an Italian designer. So it would be like uh, Fettuccine, Bugatti, Versace. Yeah, just like, yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. like complete and utter nonsense. Uh -huh. But it is so silly and so fun to do. I love how you also hold your hand this way. It's like a weird thing that almost everybody does when they do the over the top Italian caricature. Of an, yeah, you just do the hands. Up. I know. And now that's a, a emoji. Like oh, the, the, yeah, yeah. It's like this, or it's like the sh they call this the chef kiss as well. Like, Funny. <laughs> I imagine it feels like a little hollow to try to do it without doing that. Yeah, it's like you just, I don't know. I, <laughs> Sit on your hands and try and do it? Does it work the same, Dan? It's funny. It's the only language I can think of that makes me associate like hand movements with it. Well, they are a very emotive, you know, people generally speaking. So there's yeah. a lot of gesticulating. I mean, like I grew up around uh, my aunt married into a Sicilian yeah. family and it is like, it's just a lot of this all the time. Yeah, it's interesting that it's an animated culture. Like I'm sure there are plenty of like very subdued Italian of introverts. Course. But like- I have been fascinated by like out of all the Italian people I have met, mm -hmm. how many of them are pretty animated. Yeah. Especially when I went to Italy a long time ago, I was like, oh my God. So much animation. Right. So much excitement. So yeah. much so much passion. Too much for you. A little too much for me at the time. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Well, stereotypes exist for a reason, right? It's just like like me being Polish. It's like there's a lot of like stereotypes around that too. And it's like it comes. Stereotypes come from some thread of truth. Yeah, or often, often, they, exactly. They're right. based in something that's been distorted and twisted and exaggerated. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I like it when you do Italian. It's pretty funny. Ba -da -ba -da -da -da. Yeah, I just like to get my hand up. <laughs> <laughs> so silly. Malta is very high on our list of places to go. Yeah, a lot of beautiful places over mm -hmm. there. Yeah, Italy is stunning. Absolutely stunning. I'm, from what I've seen, never Wait, been. is Malta in Italy? Well, it's right there. 
Oh, near there, yeah. You know, and it's, uh, well, like, our friend Jamie was just there, and yeah. she had studied abroad in Florence, and I know that yeah. Italian is the language of Malta, if, huh. I'm, if I I say that. I tend to say things with a lot of conviction, but. Yeah, I think it's like the kingdom of Malta. I think it's a little independent country that has a, a, a lot of Italian influence. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are you ready to dig into my animal-heavy, un, like, unintentionally themed animal stories? Yes. Yes. You hear about this bunny? So, I know. So peculiar. Well, Donnie Darko. Oh, yeah. I wondered why it was like making me, I was like, I kept thinking like, what is this conjuring for me? But I couldn't place it. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Hello, queen of the spoop and king of the suck. My name is Sam, fellow Ohioan here, and I've been an avid follower of the show since the beginning. I've worked in the parks my entire professional career as everything from an educator, naturalist, park ranger, and now park manager. I see weird, twisted, and unexplainable stuff all the time, but a recent event involving my three-year-old daughter has them all beat when it comes to things that make me believe in something beyond our normal day-to-day life. Not because it was particularly scary, but because as a toddler, she had no concept of what was happening during the time the bunny came to visit. My father passed away unexpectedly at the end of June. It happened after I'd already dropped my daughter off at daycare for the day and had gone into work. After I got the news, I went straight home to pack some overnight essentials and headed straight to my parents, leaving my husband to pick up and care for our daughter while I helped my mom make all of the necessary arrangements. Before my mom and I tried to go to sleep that night, my husband FaceTimed us with my daughter so we could both say goodnight and get some giggles to help drive out the sadness we were both experiencing. No one had told my daughter that her grandpa had passed. While my daughter was rambling on about what she'd done that day, played with her friends, had a happy meal for dinner, you know, normal toddler stuff, she suddenly stopped, looked at my husband, and said very adamantly that there was a bunny in Colt's room. Colt is our lab retriever mix, and at night he sleeps in a cozy dog bed in our laundry room. At first, we thought she'd just left one of her stuffed bunnies in the laundry room while she was playing— but she continued to insist, no, the bunny is real and it's in Colt's room, not outside. She became so insistent that my husband actually got her out of bed and took her and us via the phone into the laundry room to show her that there was no bunny in the room, to which she said, oh, it went back outside. And then she continued to talk at my husband about the bunny even after we got off the phone. I remember my mom laughing and telling my husband, good luck with whatever the bunny actually was. And I told him to remember to draw a salt line at the bedroom door. (laughs) If if that had been all we'd heard of the bunny, I wouldn't be sharing the story. But the bunny continued to be brought up randomly for the next week and a half by our toddler with increasing detail. One night while she was on the potty for what felt like hours, potty training is a bitch, my daughter (laughs) mentioned the bunny being in the house again. I calmly asked what the bunny looked like, to which she replied, Bunny is as big as the sky, which is her way of saying something is very tall. Then she added that Bunny was too big to go poop on the potty. I didn't know that was a size category, but apparently to a toddler it is. And then I asked her where the bunny was in the house, and she said in her room, and that sometimes the bunny tried to sleep in her bed. My hackles went up on that detail. You can be a weird spirit critter in and around my home, but no crawling into bed with my kid. I told her she shouldn't let Bunny in her room anymore and that if it tried, she should tell it to go away. She nodded very enthusiastically at this, yelling down the hall towards the laundry at the Bunny, stay out of my room, and then cheerfully remarked that Bunny had gone back outside. She turned to go back to playing in the other room like she hadn't just told off a giant spectral rabbit and I probably should have held my tongue, but I couldn't help myself. I asked her, is the Bunny a mean Bunny? And she paused with a very thoughtful expression on her tiny little face and told me, well, it was not nice. Which again, was not something I wanted to hear. But weirdly enough, even though she had said that it wasn't nice, she didn't seem afraid of it. After that, I let her go back to playing. My husband wanted to ask more questions, but I stopped him. If there was something in the house, I wanted to know what she was actually seeing and not have her fabricate stories based on prompts given to her by us which is how things continued. She'd be playing in the living room. A toy would roll under a chair. She'd search for it, get down, and then she'd giggle and say, ha hello, bunny. Like she'd just come face to face with it under a chair. Then she'd say things like, silly bunny, followed by, bunny went back outside. The only other info our daughter offered up about bunny was that it was black in color and she continued to insist that it was very, very tall. 
Bunny almost never stayed in the laundry room anymore as she continually informed us that Bunny would go back outside once she saw it. One day, again while playing innocently on her own, she ran past the hallway to the laundry room and she stopped gleefully announcing, Bunny was gone! She repeated that statement like what felt like a dozen times before dropping the subject entirely and hasn't mentioned it since. Two days later, my mom called to inform me that she had received my dad's ashes and we could move forward with planning my dad's memorial service at my house overlooking our pond. Now, my dad was never associated with bunnies or being tall, so I don't think that it was my dad's spirit hanging around our home before his body was put to rest, but I do think there was something related to his passing. A pagan friend of mine pointed out that rabbits are often associated with the underworld and are often spirit guides between the two worlds. Was that what the bunny was doing at my house, waiting for my dad's spirit to leave his body so it could usher him on? My dad was a Christian man and never practiced pagan beliefs, so this wouldn't have been something he would have manifested on his own. My husband and I like to think that this poor spirit guide, or whatever it was, was just trying to do its job when it unfortunately ran into a very sassy toddler with the ability to see it and therefore boss it around. I like to think her ability I like to think her ability to see it has something to do with the fact that our daughter is named after Artemis, the Greek goddess of the hunt. Whatever the reason, I'm glad it's gone and I hope it doesn't come back. Benevolent or not, having your toddler talk of creepy entities you can't see is <laughs> fucked up and I have way too active of an imagination for that kind of shit. Keep sharing the amazing stories. Love what you do, Sam. Thank you, Sam. It did remind me of just like the whole time. I mean, I, I know we've mentioned this before, but like with my mom and Kyler when he was little. Oh, yeah. Little kids, you know, like saying creepy things where there's, there's a ghost. <laughs> yeah. If I, if I, it's been a while if I, or if it's, if it has been a while, a reminder of my, my mom is, um, very scared of ghost stuff. Like she won't read our books. Yeah. She wouldn't listen to the show. Like this stuff legitimately really freaks her out. Though comically, she does demand a autographed copy of every book we put yes, out. Yes, yes. For status, I think. For like to show her friends like, see, I, you know, they care about me. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but yeah, like would never read it and has even joked, but not really joking that if Tim, her, you know, my stepdad were ever to die in the house, like that can't happen because she would have to move. Yeah, I, I don't think she's joking. No, yeah, I think she's convinced that if he died in the house, like his spirit would come back. That freaks her out. Yeah. And so when, you know, there was uh, different times, like when we were doing stuff, when the kids were a little younger, that they would go stay with, you know, grandma. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if I was doing a show or whatever. Well, it was pre-me, so I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, pre-you, yeah. So it's like, yeah, they're sta- staying. I think this time I might have even been there, but he wanted to like sleep with grandma. Yeah, like go slumber downstairs, party slumber party. Mm-hmm. And our, all of all of the kids in our family are so cute that way with like slumber parties. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they all did it when they were little for quite a while. Yep. Yeah, Birdie's still having slumber parties with Grandma Betty. Oh yeah, it's yeah, so exactly. Cute. And she's like, what, ten? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, when they were walking through this dark basement, and my uh, grandma's already like, even though it's her house, skittish in the dark. Kyder just, I think he just said, look, grandma, a ghost. Uh-huh. And she said she like moved the fastest she's ever moved across that basement. Like, like got him <laughs> in the bedroom quick, shut the door, locked it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Little kids are creepy in that way. And you know, as we've discussed so, so many times here over the years, the, it does seem that the common belief and like, a commonly accepted belief is that the veil is just thinner for kids because they don't have, they're not coming to the table with all these preconceived notions. They haven't seen horror movies. They haven't experienced life the way we have. So they're just more vulnerable, susceptible, open to it. Like they just, you know, it's um, like that childlike belief, that childlike imagination. There's something, you know, more to it, I think. Yeah, there is. There is like, you know, two main schools of thought. And one of them is that like, you know, kids have, you know, basically kids say the darndest things. Yeah. Kids have like, you know, trouble differentiating imagination from true experience. Yeah. And different things. And their their brains are pretty undeveloped in some ways. And there's this thing that like, yeah, they just don't know what they're saying really. Uh-huh. Little well, ding dong. Yeah. Doing it for attention, maybe variety of things. Yeah. And then the other side, obviously that like, that the veil is thinner and they are seeing things. And I do think like how terrible if that part is true and you're seeing something scary and then all these big protectors around you are just like, uh, okay, yeah, Enough yeah, yeah. You're uh, fine. Yep, let's stop. Okay, now for the attention, you know, uh, grabbing techniques or whatever. Yeah. 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 You were seeing some weirdly shape-shifting bunny that is sometimes giant, but then sometimes small enough to be under a piece of furniture. Oh, my God. The thought of, as an adult, 
going to like lying down on your stomach to reach underneath the couch to like grab a dog toy or a kid yeah. toy or whatever. And then there's just a bunny down there. No, thanks. I don't even care if it's like a fluffy, yummy, sweet bunny. Mm -hmm. No, thanks. I think there is a kind of bunny too that does have red eyes. Well, you have like the mask. You were like that bunny one year for Halloween. Like Monroe thought it would yeah. be so funny. Yeah, there's that mask, but I think there is. Oh, like an actual an rabbit. Actual, actual rabbit animal. Sorry. That um, often has red eyes. There is, my dad used to have a couple when he was a kid. Yeah, they're creepy. They really are. They really are. Seems unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I just, I what, I what I also enjoyed about that story is that I actually didn't know that, um, maybe I didn't, maybe I did know and I forgot, but just about like, Spirit guides often showing up in animal form to like guide mm, you, mm -hmm. take you to the to the afterlife, and that they're. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like bunnies are generally not a bad thing. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I do love uh, the name Artemis too. By the way, I know. I want. Do you guys call her Artie? Do you call her Artemis? Does she have a nickname? I have so many questions. Okay, one more. Let's do it. Okay, I didn't even ask you about your Layla, but well, I was noticing more. that blue Layla matches your shirt kind of. Oh yeah. Like like it feels like blue Layla could be like in the mm -hmm. fits. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Here we go. Okay. Big fan, love the scary. Let's get to it. <laughs> <laughs> ha! Like it. Perfect. Mm -hmm. When I was 10 years old, my family moved into a large, a large home built in the 1920s after adopting my three younger siblings and outgrowing our old place. The home had a servant's quarters, a grand master staircase, an open and accessible and creepy as shit attic, a large barn garage, and a refinished basement. It was so beautiful, and we all fell in love with it immediately. And it didn't hurt that I would finally get my own room after three years of sharing my room with my older sister and our then foster sister. My room was in the basement with a depressed egress window and a door inside of the room that led to the well room with walls that were completely unfinished rock and dirt and a well dug in the back corner. While the room was strange and out of place, I was just so happy to have room to myself. As we adjusted to the home and I began to get used to sleeping with no one in my vicinity, strange things began to happen. I would go to sleep with my closet light on and when I awoke, it would be pitch black. The door to the well room would often open itself while I slept, which made no sense as the doorknob and latch were new and had no give when pushed. It happened over and over. I would wake up in a cold sweat to my bedroom door open and a small figure watching me, motionless but clearly there. That was my brother, then four. He would have no memory, though, of these occurrences. I wrapped a bungee cord around the doorknob and attached it to the doorknob into the unfinished well room to make a makeshift lock, and that solved that problem. But another one soon arose. During the nights that late summer and early fall, I was winding down to sleep when I heard a thunk, 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 thunk against my window. Terrified, imagining a man crouched in the well waiting for me to pull back the curtain before breaking through and grabbing me, I hid under my covers and was very aware that if I were to make a noise, whatever was in the window well would be the closest thing to me and would have all the time in the world to do what it wanted to do with me before my parents on the top floor could even hear me. I cried, but I knew I only had one option scare it before it got me. <laughs> I quietly worked my small feet across the floor, my heart beating hard in my chest before ripping back the curtain to see frogs? Frogs and toads throwing themselves at the window over <laughs> and over again. And then I saw one tiny little toad body motionless while there were others throwing themselves frantically against the window like their lives depended on it. And another frog, who had just hit the window, lay motionless, dead from beating its body against my window. I was confused, terrified, and disgusted by this. And it wasn't just one night that it happened. Even after my dad helped me remove the remaining living toads and frogs from my window well, more and more would replace themselves each night. In this room, I also experienced random bouts of fainting. I could be doing homework, reading a book, watching TV, and then suddenly my vision went black and I would wake up on the floor. When I told the doctor this, they ran all the blood tests, stress tests, everything, and the only thing they thought it was was that my blood pressure plummeted idiopathically, meaning without discernible cause. The moment that truly proved to me that something was there happened in the aforementioned creepiest shit addict. My best friend, a true ne'er-do-well, hmm. who, who was always talking me into doing stupid shit, finally convinced me to have a sleepover in the dreaded bare-bones attic. 
The attic had a large main space that could have become a living quarters, but was not insulated and had no electricity hookup. But near the attic staircase was a dark, narrow crawl space with only one or two small floorboards lying across insulation material, which was the only separation between the attic and the plaster ceiling of my brother's room. We never went back there because it would be nearly impossible to get to the far side and back without your foot going through the ceiling. My friend and I set up an air mattress in the main attic area and brought up snacks and a DVD player. You know, the kind, the small travel TV and DVD players and settled in for a spooky night. I was never one to stay up all night. So by 2 a.m. I passed out as my friend watched yet another movie. I woke into complete darkness, disoriented for some reason, and I was terrified. Chelsea, are you awake? My friend was whispering, barely audible. Yes, I whispered back, matching her volume. Do you hear that? Her normal voice, that of a daredevil preteen, was gone, and a scared, stammering child spoke back to me. Hear what? I began to say before I heard a thud in the far side of the attic. We fell deeply silent, so quiet that I knew neither of us dared to breathe. Thud. I gently, sh gently shifted as carefully as I could closer to my friend. Thud. It sounded like the board in the crawl space was being stood on, but that was impossible. It was barely thick enough to hold a cat, let alone whatever was making that sound. We should go, I said, my mouth as close to her ear as I could manage in the inky blackness, afraid that whatever we were hearing would hear us in turn. I felt her head nod gently, and I slid my legs silently to the floor. Thud. I gently guided my friend's legs to the ground, gingerly putting my weight on one leg, then the other, praying over and over for the floorboards to remain silent. My friend put her weight onto one foot and then the other, and then creak. We froze. Thud, 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 thud. The sound of a being rapidly approaching us as if something was crawling at full speed across the boards right toward us. We screamed, my heart hitting my rib cage furiously as I flipped the air mattress against where I believed the entrance to the crawl space was into the darkness. And my friend and I half ran, half fell down the stairs, reaching the bottom more by ass than by foot <laughs> and kicked the door open. We thundered into my parents' room, sobbing. My dad raced into the attic with his bat and a flashlight. He found nothing, of course, but the air mattress had deflated and a large scratch on the side facing the crawl space was the culprit. My parents let us sleep in full light on the main floor for the rest of the night, although we never did sleep. Something had a home up there and didn't appreciate our company. I never stayed in the attic again after dark again, and I had a lock installed on my well room door when I confessed all of the happenings to my parents. They put a cross in my room and prayed over it. I experienced a few small things still, notably the frogs, the fainting, random cold spots, and noises without a source, but never did I encounter whatever it was that was in the attic, and I did everything possible to avoid being, uh, to avoid that being from ever having that opportunity to get to me again. Chelsea. Thanks, Chelsea. Thank you, Chelsea. Yeah, that, uh, the early stuff in that story of the frogs battering themselves in the window. I mean, it reminded me of like birds doing that. Like a bird will fly into a window, like one. Yeah. You know, like you just, uh, during the day almost always because you just can't see the glass. Well, yeah, the glass is like too clean. That's like <laughs> yeah. that old Windex commercial. Oh, oh, right, 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 right. And then, but frogs, and then I guess in the darkness, that's creepy that they would do it hard enough to sometimes kill themselves. I know. It, it, remind, it reminded me of like a um, apocalyptic biblical scene, like a, like a plague of locusts and frogs falling from the sky and stuff. That's exactly what I thought. I was like, what in the frick frack? Like, where do yeah. you live? Like, also like frogs are generally like near some source of like water. Yeah. So I'm yeah. like, where do you live? I had like, I have so many questions about like, is there a pond on your property? Where were they coming from? How did they get there? Why there? Yeah. I mean, I guess if it was, if there was a well... Yeah, it could be a bunch of tadpoles down in there, and then they, yeah. like, yep, uh, grow up and try and climb their way, bounce or jump their way out. Ah, so strange. I need. I feel like I need a picture to understand the visual of what was happening there. Yeah, yeah. Like, because I was thinking, like, e you know, basement bedroom, like egress window. So the bedroom's down here, the yeah. egress window is here, and the frogs are here. I was picturing the frogs down in the bottom trying to jump. Jump like, out? Yeah. And so the frogs would be on the inside of the house? No, like, it, like, um, she said the well room was in her bedroom. I was picturing the egress window kind of having that like, um, okay, like we have one of these at our house. Like like there's that car that carved out where you could like yeah, walk yeah. out of it. And I picture a lot of them where they have like, usually it's like, uh, is it, I don't know if it's aluminum or metal, but like oh, yeah, that a little like, half circle that goes down into the ground. Right. That's a safety thing. You have to have that. Right. So you could climb out. And so that no one falls down. 
Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I was just picture, picture like in that little pit right in front of the window. Oh, okay. Beneath the level of the yard is where uh, water could, it could pool, be a, l- pool a little bit. at least, or at least the little frogs get like stuck down oh, there. Okay. There you go. That's try helpful. And jump, jump back out. Okay. But instead yeah. jumped into her bedroom window. Yeah. 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 Well, still put a grate over the top of that. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Put some. Just a weird phenomenon. Put some frog killer in there. There are weird stuff with frogs. I was uh, frogs are so creepy. Well, there has been stuff like there has been strange storm conditions that have created like raining frogs. Not even joking. They can get like uh, she doesn't believe me. Logan, have you heard of this? I actually have. Yeah, yeah. It's like a really weird thing where it's like basically like think about like a hurricane type situation, and it's going or some type of tornado thing over uh, a boggy area where the frog gets sucked up into the air and then rain back down upon the earth, but sometimes a little ways away. Like how weird would that be if you're just like walking to the lawn and all of a sudden you literally have frogs raining down upon you? What do you think would happen to me? Uh, <laughs> you would. I bet you would. Um, you would squeal. You would freak out. You weren't too bad. You would freak out, kind of like the mouse situation at the cabin, this uh-huh. time, but but more severely. There was a shrieking. Mouse. There'd be shrieking. There was a little tiny mouse. Little field in, mouse. Yeah. Yeah, little baby mouse in our cabin at summer camp this past week, and. Okay, I grew up in like a city, even though like I was like in a suburb. It was just I did not grow up in the the country. Yeah. I did not grow grow up around even like this like like well situation. Like so hard for my brain to comprehend oh, it because yeah. it's so foreign to how I grew up. We didn't have a septic tank. Like it's just yeah. you know we didn't we didn't live off like well water like all those things. So living completely across the country now, you learn so many interesting things like this where you're like, oh yeah, like that makes sense. It's obvious, but because it's not the way you grew up. Okay. So we never had a mouse in our house. We never had like a rat. There was like just never any concern yeah. about anything like that. So here's Dan and I, it was like night one or night two in the cabin and we're having a cocktail, chit-chatting. And I see the little flash of like white gray go across the floor yep. and I just went, ah! And then I jumped up on top yep. of this like uh, coffee table situation yeah. and I was losing my ever loving mind. You were, you did a really good job of not laughing at me too much. Cause then I had a, <laughs> I had a lot of questions. This yeah. is how you know that I grew up in a city. I was like, where is it? You got to find it, get the mouse traps. Okay. We need to like pick up all the food. I was thinking logically for a yeah, few minutes. Pick up the food. And then I refused to walk on the floor. It was like the floor is lava. I just, I was certain that if I put my feet on the floor. Did I carry you into the bedroom? Uh, you did. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, I was certain that if I put my feet on the floor that like it was going to like come and like I don't know latch onto me I don't like I don't know then I was afraid to go to sleep because I thought it was going to crawl up into bed with us like I was outside of my mind I had to go to the bathroom I made you turn on all the lights oh, yeah. check the bathroom I, I, I like escort you to the bathroom for something this big yep and then a couple days later because my mom was staying in the cabin with us she saw it yeah and and then I saw it again but chose it not ran to tell across you. your foot yeah, I was getting a snack and it just like went over my foot. But, but I was just like, well, I feel, you know, whatever, little mouse. Um, but <laughs> but I do remember at first making the mistake of answering your questions honestly. Because you'd be like, I mean, could it like crawl over to sleep? And I'm like, well, yeah, I guess so. I mean, if it just like got on the bed. <laughs> I slept that night with, I don't sleep <laughs> like fully clothed. I slept with like workout pants on, socks, like, <laughs> like you know, like pants, socks over top of yeah. pants. Uh, I couldn't sleep with a long sleeve shirt on because I would get too hot because Dan's a furnace. But like... Oh, I was tucked in so tight. I was so freaked out. And like, we're in, we're not in our space. So there wasn't like a bedside table. So my yeah. phone charger was on the floor. And I just, no matter what time I woke up, I, there was no way I was like reaching over the side of the bed. Cause in my mind, I was going to reach down to grab my phone. And then like the mouse was going to come out and bite my hand. Well, cause then you said that one of our friends, uh, Jeff, Jeff Wilson, like you were like talking yeah. about how he um, said he got bit, was taking a nap in his camper and a mouse bit him. Yes. I had to talk to him about this. Uh, about, but I, I like, crawl over him sure but bite him maybe, that's unusual maybe they had rats maybe but then then even then it'd be like what is he rabid well i don't know but i actually i just was like reading through some fan stories working yeah. on some future episodes and uh this fan said in this story i probably won't share because it's not paranormal it's just like a like oh my god that's a scary story like yeah. what the heck but they were staying in this apartment that they go to like every year or whatever and the the mom and daughter are sharing a bed and the daughter keeps waking up because she's like hearing sounds. She's seeing like their shopping bags move. She feels something like tugging on their blanket. Yeah. Eventually the mom wakes up and notices it too. So then they just, they're like, all right, screw it. We're going to sleep in the living room. And then they like notice like activity. Like there's like movement. They can't figure it out. Huge fucking rat. Oof. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. 
and and it's it it had nibbled on them. So yeah, rats are creepy. Rats are. Um, I mean, this is pretty okay. Just a little uh, graphic warning, but there was this um, on Time Suck early on. We co- I covered this guy Richard Kuklinski. Kuklinski. He has a Polish last name that has a weird like double K in there. That's hard for me to say. Kuklinski. Yeah, Kuklinski. Um, but he was the Ice Man, and he was like this uh, hitman for the mafia on the East Coast. Cool. And so he couldn't be like a made man because okay. he wasn't Italian, but like, uh, but he was a hitman for I can't remember which crime family, maybe even a couple. But there was this one hit he supposedly did where he took this guy out in the woods or whatever. I can't remember if it was a cabin or a cave. I want to say cave actually randomly, tied him to a chair, and I think made wounds on him. Oh God! But but left some put some kind of attractant on him, whether it was the guy's blood or something else, to let the rats eat him to death. What did that guy do to deserve that? Uh, jaywalked. It's a big, uh, could have got, got a car accident, you know? This, yeah. I don't remember. <laughs> that was a terrible, <laughs> terrible bluff. You want to do some Annabelle shout outs? Sure. Okay, I'll go first this time. Well, a huge thank you to all of our supporters. Thank you for coming to camp. Thank you for all the things that you do to make what we do possible. Yeah. We are so appreciative if we don't say it enough. Um, and so thank you to these Annabelles for this uh well, we, we don't know what the October to charity is yet, but for all the previous donations. Logan Omley, Atlantis Frost, Cass Bellarose, Allison Dufault, Roxanne um, Arandado, Leslie L., Dietrich C., Alyssa Celentano, uh, Emily Pfeiffer, and Caitlin Plank. Thank you, Annabelles. And I'll thank the following Annabelles. Kyle Jakowski, Miranda Galindo, Kylie Kelly, Kelly I know Keely, I didn't know oh, K-E-I-L-I-E maybe Keely Keely Langwell Jamie uh, McAvoy Liz and Malia Ashley Chauf or yeah I think it's Ashley Chauf uh, Francisco Tavares Jonathan Finn <laughs> P.P. McGee P.P. P.P. McGee and Gwendolyn Phillips cute all right, and then I have the following spooky shout outs. Uh, a few more than usual this week because with camp, I got a little distracted. So apologies that I missed some of these. Two pirate captain from Rose. Happy birthday and happy wedding day. Uh, I believe that this is the couple that is getting married on the 13th. So not long from now. To Tyler from Mariah, happy creeper birthday. Hope your birthday is amazing and that you have a spooky trip to Salem. To Funkel Jojo from Z and Q, happiest of B days. We love you so much. To Steph from the great Robbie Bobby, happy anniversary to my beautiful wife. I'm more in love with you now than I was 10 years ago. To Ivo from your son Aaron, happy birthday. Hope we had an amazing time seeing the Eagles. I'm assuming you mean the football game. Uh, to Zach from your favorite pain in the ass, happy belated anniversary. I love you and so do Turkey and Sissy. Also, <laughs> I'm funnier than you. And to Fox Queen from the Fox King, happy birthday. I love you so muchly. I think that was a little inside joke. Mm, so muchly. Oh, oh very so cute. Muchly. Uh, that is our show. Thank you for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror. We love them so much. My story at scared to death podcast.com. Email us for anything else. Info at scared to death podcast.com. Thank you to Logan Keith for producing, directing, scoring today. Also did a great job making the Wet Hot Bad Magic Summer Camp look amazing. Yes. The Scared to Death set was fantastic. So, so cool. Um, thanks to Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. Book editor Drew Atana for polishing and preparing listener stories for book number five. Thanks to producer Olivia Lee for finding the second story I told this week. I was able to find the first. If you'd like to listen and watch, please subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube and check out the set. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want pics that accompany episodes and more at Scared to Death Podcast, which is our TikTok handle as well. And we have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, where you can meet fellow horror lovers. And that, uh, if you don't want any more ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes and more, check out our Patreon. And that is it. And that is it. Enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. What did that guy do to deserve that? Uh, Jaywalked. 
big uh could have got a, could have got a car accident, you know? 